Last week we talked about spiritual growth and uh, I, I thought it was a, a good and necessary service. We're all called to grow up spiritually. If you weren't here, you can go onto YouTube and, and you can listen to it or Spotify or anywhere that we have it. And uh, when I got home, I received a text from a friend of Rachel and mine and uh, the text was, uh, you know, great service this morning, really helped. And then they said, I'm just putting this out there. They said, I wonder if we could ever get a series on accountability. And they said, what does accountability mean in how do we work this growing process and how can we be held to account to make sure that we do grow up? And I text them back and I was like, man, that's an amazing idea. I'll take it to the Lord in prayer because I thought I knew where we were going to go this Sunday. And so I already was working on some other stuff. And then I just prayed about it a little bit, didn't think a whole lot about it. And then on Thursday, the Holy Spirit just really, really began to deal with me. And remember, we talk about this. The way he deals with me is the same way he deals with you. There was no computers lit on fire. There was no glory cow that filled my office. Woo, that'd be rad if it happens. And if it does happen to you, please share. I would like to hear that testimony. But most of the time when God is ministering and leading me, I just have this perception, this small, still voice on the inside. Reminds me of how Elijah was led when he was up on the mountain. God was not in the thunder or in the lightning or in the earthquake, but he was in the small, still voice saying, this is the way, amen? And so we've got to get good at hearing that voice. And on Thursday, he just began to whisper to my heart about this thing called accountability. And thank you for all of your enthusiasm. <laughs> at the end of the day, we as human beings don't like to be held to an account. Accountability in its simplest form simply is defined as responsibility. And nobody likes to be held responsible for their actions. We see this from the top tier in our governments around the world, people in power, and we see it in every infrastructure throughout the world, uh, whether it's business, whether it's governments, whether it's homes, whether it's churches. We just don't like accountability that much. But friends, if we're going to grow up spiritually, we're going to have to be held accountable. Accountable to what? The teachings of God's word. Let me just say this. Uh, as a believer, there is a standard in which we are supposed to live by. Now listen, we're human and lots of times we do fall short. And that's not the issue. The issue is if when you fall short, if you don't get back up and continue to walk after him, right? And I know that in the modern church, we're trying to dilute the standard and water down the standard. But friends, the standard will never change. The standard is God's word. And as a believer, I am called to live by that standard. I'm not perfect at it, but I'm making progress. Someone say progress. And one way to make progress is to make sure that I'm held accountable by my actions or for my actions. Let's go all the way back to the beginning so that I can show you that we as human beings don't really like accountability. I really do believe this is one reason why so many people choose to believe in evolution. Yeah. Evolution is really easier because if you really believe that you just were evolved from an ape, then you've given yourself permission to behave like an animal. And what evolution does is it decays any sense of responsibility or accountability because at the end of the day, when I'm looking lustfully at a woman, I'm just a dog anyways. When I'm going to steal from this person or that person, I'm just an animal anyways, and this is just animalistic behavior. So at the end of the day, I'm just going back to the core of who I am. You know, after the French Revolution, there came this time of the Enlightenment, and the Enlightenment brought forth a time of reason, and what reason did was reason replaced God, and science replaced faith. And it's so interesting to me that even during the time of Enlightenment, they still made a goddess statue and worshipped her, so at the end of the day, they still needed something to worship. Friends, make no mistake, you were created for worship. And if we don't worship him, we're going to worship something else. We're going to worship whatever idol it might be. You know, the Bible tells us that man cannot worship money and God for he'll love one and hate the other for no man can serve two masters. When you study it out, that word instead of money is actually mammon. What is mammon? That was actually a goddess. It was an idol. So when he's saying you can't worship money, he's saying you cannot worship any other God. And this God, for you'll love one and hate the other. Friends, if we don't worship him, 
listen, at the end of the day, you are worshiping something. It's either self, it's either culture, or it's the living God. I take the stance of Joshua, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we will worship the Lord. But guess what, friends? In that journey, I need accountability. And if I'm going to be held to account, I've got to understand that I'm going to have to go against everything in my human nature because my human nature despises accountability. Over here in the very beginning, Genesis chapter 3, verses 8 through 13, someone say, this is going to be good. And if you don't like the subject, then just go ahead and uh, change it right now and release your faith because you're all going to help me this morning. Amen. Going to believe God. Genesis chapter 3, verses 8 through 13 says, Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he as was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees in the garden. First of all, what happened? We didn't have time to read the whole thing. I should have just read the whole thing because now I'm going to go ahead and give an explanation. It would have been easier. We know that God made the garden. He'd put him in it, gave him everything, said, Thou shalt not eat from the tree of good and evil. And then uh, in Genesis chapter 3, we know that the serpent comes in, begins to speak to them to get them to question what God said. And he will do that in your life every time. When it comes to your family, when it comes to your career, when it comes to the things you believe in God for, he will always try, the devil will always try to get you to question what God has said. And then notice they, they, they fall subject to this. They partake of the fruit. They eat and they're separated. They realize they're naked. Listen, friends, every time we compromise, the immediate result of that is shame. And whenever you feel shame, you will hide yourself from your creator. And that's powerful, and the reason why the devil does that is because if he can get you to hide from your creator, the one who's going to help you in every situation, the one who's going to answer and fix your problems, the one who's going to take care of you, protect you, provide for you, watch over you, heal you, keep you in your sound mind, if he can separate you from the one who does that, friends, you're in real trouble. Right? And so it says they hid themselves amongst the trees of the garden. Verse 9. But the Lord God called the man. I love that so much. He, don't you know when you make a mistake, God knows it. I think it's funny how we try to hide things from the one who knows everything. You know he's omniscient, right? That's made up of two words, omni, which means all, and science, which means knowledge. God is all knowledge. He knows everything. He knows when you make a mistake. It's so funny in our human, uh, dare I say, pea brains. I don't know if that's a proper way of saying it, but we just think we're so smart. You can't hide anything from the creator. And since I realized that, I should just stop trying. Why do I try to hide things from him? Right? He knows everything. So God knows that Adam and Eve have messed up. They've committed high treason against God Almighty. They hid themselves. He knows that, but yet he still comes to them in the garden. Friends, he's not going to turn his back on you. Never has and never will. For nothing can separate you from the love of God. No demon, no angel, no sin, nothing can separate you. Amen? And so he comes to them and he says, where are you? He answered, verse 10, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid. And he said, who told you that you were naked? You have eaten from the tree I commanded you not to eat from. Then the man said, what are we talking about? Accountability. So man and women, they're in this position together. God comes to Adam, begins to talk to him about it, and watch Adam's response. You all know this, but let's just look at it. Then man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree. So immediately Adam begins to take accountability and responsibility and shuffle it off onto someone else. He and, and it's amazing, we all know this, but it's amazing how, number one, he blamed God for his issue. Another good thing that the devil likes to do, he deceives people all the time to make them think that God is the problem. Friends, he's not the source of your problem. He's the source of your answer. He will always be your answer. Amen. Uh, Adam didn't fall because God made Eve. This whole situation is not God's fault. All right. And then Adam didn't fall because Eve made a mistake. Adam fell because he chose to participate. And both of them are guilty. The woman and the man. Both of them are guilty. So you could say it this way. It's everybody's fault. 
No one is free from this, all right? But Adam, he doesn't want to take accountability or responsibility. He begins to shuffle it off on God, shuffles it off on the woman. The man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me fruit to eat from the tree, and I ate it. Verse 13, then the Lord God said to the woman, what is it that you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. So let me just challenge you and think about this. How often is it everyone else's fault? It's rhetorical. You don't have to answer. Woo. I'm not trying to be offensive this morning, but it's always someone else's fault. It's either the father or mother you had or did not have. And both are never satisfied. I had parents and they just messed me all up. I didn't have parents and because of that I'm all messed up. It's always, well, my boss did this. My boss said that. Husbands and wives, how many times is it, well, woman said. Right? Or woman's like, well, man didn't do. He's clearly forgotten everything he learned in orientation. (laughs) And now we have an issue. But the point is, is that's what we do all the time. My brother's fault. My sister's fault. My parents' fault. The lack of parents. Society's fault. Government's fault. And we always blame someone else. Every time we decide to cover up instead of confess, we're making a decision to live in defeat instead of victory. Every time we decide to cover up instead of confess, we're making a decision to live in defeat instead of victory. Job chapter 31 verse 33. Have I tried to hide my sins like other people do? Concerning my guilt in my heart. Proverbs chapter 28, verse 13, now the NIV. Whoever conceals their sins does not prosper, but the one who confesses and renounces finds mercy. We need to come. The Bible says that if we confess God, but we have darkness in us, then we really don't belong to him. Right? Right? We need to just make a decision that I'm no longer going to try to live in the shadows, but I'm going to come into the light. I'm no longer going to try to conceal, but I'm going to confess. I'm no longer going to try to hide, but I'm going to expose. I'm no longer going to try to make excuses, but friends, I'm going to take accountability. Galatians chapter 6, verse 4 out of the Amplified says, but each one must carefully scrutinize his own work, examining his actions, attitudes, and behavior. And then he can have a personal satisfaction and inner joy of doing something commendable without comparing himself to another. So I'm not up here, and we've talked about this before, how God's word is described as a mirror and not a window. I'm not using God's word as a window to look into your life and judge everything. I'm using it as a mirror to look into Robert's life to judge my thoughts, to judge my behavior, to judge my actions. And then I'm going to let God show me the error of my ways by the Holy Spirit and the revelation of his word. And then I'm going to take accountability and I'm going to say, Father, this is where I've missed it. Maybe I haven't been loving my wife as Christ loved the church. Maybe I have been disciplining my children when I haven't disciplined myself and I'm leading them under wrath. Maybe I have neglected this or neglected that. I'm going to allow God through the revelation of his word and the power of the Holy Spirit expose some things in my life. Woo, friends, and there's liberty in that. There's liberty in that. You cannot have this relationship with God where he's not constantly tailoring you and working on you to make you better. Friends, that's just the way it works. And this is one reason why people hate church. Because church in this setting demands accountability. We're going to learn from God's word today and it's going to challenge us. The world doesn't like to be challenged to become better morality. They don't want to be better morally. We can see this. 
by the simple rejection of God Almighty. He is the moral standard and he does not change. And so when we reject him, we're rejecting morality. And every time we get closer to him, he's making us better and he's making us more moral. He's making me more moral in my actions, in my words, in my thoughts, in my deeds. Glory to God. And so I examine my own actions and my own attitudes and my own behavior. And then I demand better of myself. I don't, man, I don't demand better of you. I demand better of myself. Personal accountability. Amen. And so we need godly relationships. So now we know that we're supposed to be accountable and we reject accountability. How can we overcome that rejection so we can grow in it? Well, we need God relationships to help us be accountable. Now, listen, when we talk about accountability, let me tell you just a couple things that it's not real quick. It is not a spirit of correction. God has not placed you in his body as a minister of correction. You don't run around telling everybody what they need to fix. No, we just read it. You judge your own actions and your own behavior and your own attitudes. Right? What, what else isn't it? Well, accountability is not so you can look down on people and have a mindset as I am more holier than thou. There's no one in this place. That the one that's more holier than thou is he who is holy, holy, holy. Amen? But I don't, I don't want to help people so I can look down on them and judge them as less than. No, friends, we're all in this life together, glory to God. And we should be here to help one another, to love one another, to encourage one another, to support one another. Amen? So let's look at these relationships that we should have that should help us. Well, first of all, understand that you shouldn't be going about this alone. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 7 through 12 says, I observed yet another example of something meaningless under the sun. This is the case of a man who is all alone, without a child or a brother, yet who works hard to gain as much wealth as he can. But, at the, but then he asked himself, who am I working for? Why am I given, forgive me, why am I giving up so much pleasure now? It's all so meaningless and depressing. Two people are better than one, for they can help each other succeed. If one person falls, woo, I got anyone in the room that's ever fallen before. Mm-hmm. Everybody in the church should have said amen. I got anybody in the house that's ever fallen before. Well, look at what the scriptures tell us. If one falls, the other can reach out and help. Someone say help. But someone who falls and is alone is in real trouble. Likewise, two people laying close together can keep each other warm. But how can one be warm alone? A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated. But two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better, for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. The devil loves to get us alone. He loves to put you on an island by yourself. And then when you're on an island by yourself, that's really when he comes to your thoughts. That's really when he comes. <clears throat> I say it this way, idle time is the devil's playground. When Robert's got nothing going on and the family's away and I'm sitting on my couch by myself, that's when the devil comes. Listen, friends, you're not supposed to do life alone. God understands this. And so he brings us together. Hebrews 10, 23 through 25 out of the Amplified. Let us seize and hold tightly to the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who is promised is reliable, trustworthy, and faithful to his word. Verse 24, and let us consider thoughtfully how we may encourage one another to love and to do good deeds, not forsaking our meeting together as believers for worship and instruction as in the habit of some, but encourage one another and all the more faithfully as you see the day of Christ's return approaching. So what is he saying here? He's saying that we should gather for worship and as we gather for worship, we're building relationships that are going to encourage us. It's going to encourage us. And, and he's saying, don't be like some who's fallen away, but instead as the day of my return gets closer and closer, you should be gathering more and more. What is he telling us? You can really look at this and see. He's saying it's going to get worse out there and you're going to need your church family more than ever. And so don't pull back from this gathering away, but instead, every single time you have the opportunity, come worship with your brothers and sisters in Christ. And friends, as we worship, we develop the relationships that we need. Number one, we develop our relationship with God. 
which is the most important. Number two, we develop a relationship with our spiritual leadership. Right? Whether you ever have a personal dinner with Pastor Mark and Pastor Ronna, every time you sit underneath their teaching, you're developing a relationship with your pastors. The ones who are shepherds to watch over you and give an account for your soul. As you sit underneath their teaching and you come on Sunday mornings and you come to saturation and you come to midweek and you enroll in Bible Institute, what you're doing is you're developing a relationship with your shepherds so they can watch over your soul. It's very hard for a shepherd to watch over the sheep if the sheep aren't in the pen. Amen? And so we develop a relationship with the Lord. We develop a relationship with our spiritual leadership. And then number three, we develop a relationship with one another. And even though all three of them are important, I want to spend a little bit of time focusing on the relationships that we should have with one another. Friends, Cornerstone makes a lot of effort to make sure that you build friendships in this place. And we have so many different ways to do it. The easiest way to do it is plug in and start serving. When you join the prayer team, the usher team, the praise and worship team, the children's ministry, the youth ministry, what, the sound team, the production team. Uh, when you join those teams, what you're doing, if I can use this phrase, you're joining a brotherhood or a sisterhood. What, ser- what really draws people close together is serving in the trenches together. And you build relationships and connections that you would not build otherwise. Because you're no longer casual about coming to this place, but you're invested. You're putting who you are into what happens in this room, and so your heart is furthermore attached to it. We, we, we see it all the time in different ministries. When the devil is pulling people away, they begin to unplug from the places that they're serving. Because they've got to sever relationships and connections before they can walk away with their right mind. It's very hard to walk away when you're connected. And then if you do start showing signs of falling away, you're connected to a team that can follow up with you. Hey, I haven't seen you ushering in three weeks. Is everything okay? And they begin to hold us accountable to this life of worship, to walking with God, connecting ourselves to the body. Another way we do it, we have these things at church called connect groups. Thank you for that one amen. Glory to God. Get get Ms. Mary a microphone. Amen. Just one single amen in the whole house of God. (laughs) What are connect groups? Well, these are different fellowship groups. The reason why I go to them, not only because I like to play basketball and soccer and video games. Those are the three that I go to. There's others out there. There's a a crochet one, which is like a knitting group. Y'all, I knit something once in home school or uh, in uh, home ec in school. It fell apart as soon as I left the room. (laughs) We made backpacks, and I put the strap on there. I walked out, and the backpack fell to the floor. Like, my knitting did. So I'm not going to go to no stitching group because I can't figure out how to do that. The only stitching we did in Colorado, one time our horse got cut, and we had to stitch his leg up with dental floss. <laughs> we lived too far away from the vet. Dad did that, and I was just thinking, man, that's mint flavored. That's got to burn, you know? <laughs> when you live in the mountains, you do what you have to. We have these connect groups, these fellowship-based groups. And what are they really for? They're so we can make relationships. There's been so many times when we're at the basketball connect group and there's a bunch of guys out there that are playing, but then there's just some of us that are sitting on the stage, mainly because we're winded. So it's usually Adam and all the young ones that are still out there running back and forth. I'm like, you know, I'm just going to give you a minute, you know, because you need it. I don't need it. You need a minute. So I'm just going to sit right here and watch you play for a minute. But we have these conversations about life and career and family. And we're able to encourage one another through simple conversations. We're able to have Kononia. And the Bible talks about this Kononia. And it talks about this fellowship in so many different ways that we're going to have it. When you actually study some of it in the Old Testament, that's why God asked them all to give in the building of the temple through their finances and their resources. And it says when everyone was given, they had Kononia of given. Fellowship through their given. We have, we have Konania, and so when, when you come in here and we take up tithes and offering, it's not that we're just, it, one reason God's doing that, he's producing fellowship through your giving. We're doing it together as a family and as the body of Christ. 
And so this stuff is important, and we understand that we need each other. Let's go over to a familiar passage, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And so we have different fellowship groups, and these fellowship groups are amazing, and they're there so we can get to know one another and build these bonds with each other because, friends, you need these bonds so you can be held accountable. I said you need these bonds so you can be held accountable. And let me just say, we're not going to talk about it this morning, but I'll just go ahead and put it out there. Husbands and wives, that is your accountability partner. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We'll get there in a minute. But I don't really understand if this is you. I low-key hope it does make you feel bad. I'm just teasing y'all. No man or woman should have a cell phone who their spouse does not know the lock code to. Rachel spends more time on my phone than I do. Just kidding. She doesn't. I don't understand why I've seen couples do this, you know. Uh, Give me your phone. No. Well, why not? What you got on there that you don't want them to see? Why you got a lock code that they don't know? (laughs) Amen. (laughs) What are we talking about? We're talking about accountability. Who are you texting? Nobody. That's what I say. I say, I'm texting so-and-so. You want to do it for me? (laughs) That'd be great, you know. (laughs) There are no secrets between a husband and wife. At least there should not be any secrets between a husband and wife. And there should be absolute honesty and transparency. When Rachel and I got married, hmm, oh, Lord Jesus. I told her, I said, here's a problem that I had in high school with lust and sexual desire. I need your help staying pure. Why do we think it's weakness to be honest? Friends, to tell the truth requires strength. To hide it is weakness. And then my wife and I We have conversations all the time if something's starting to come up. (laughs) Hey, girl, you know, I'm starting to have these thoughts. We need to schedule some husband and wifey time. (laughs) Keeping that clean because my boys are in the room. (laughs) Boys, plug your ears. Go to the bathroom real quick. (laughs) Ha! <laughs> I, 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 I was going to share something, but for the sake of the boys, I won't. Hallelujah. But it's our job to hold each other accountable. I'll say it second service because they won't be here. <laughs> Your spouse can't help you remain accountable if you constantly lie to them. If you don't tell them the truth and what you're struggling with. When in the very beginning, when God made man... The first time he said it's not good is when man was alone. And I really think one reason he said that is because this man has no accountability. You know, whenever people find themselves alone, they get in real trouble. We can look at David when everybody was out at war and he stayed behind in the palace all by himself. And he woke up from a little nap and he's out there on his porch, you know, living that king life. And he sees Bathsheba taking a bath. Right? And he got in trouble. No one there to hold him accountable. And yes, he was in the wrong place at the wrong time. A king should have been out at war with his people. But man, how quickly things unravel. And I really believe that when David wrote in the book of Psalms, because David, even though he didn't write all the Psalms, he, he, I think they say that he wrote 74 of them. Ezra wrote some, Psalmist wrote others. But in Psalms 1 where he says, uh, don't sit in the seat of the scornful. That word scornful means imposter. And David is outcast from his own kingdom, and I believe he's reflecting and looking back, and he's saying, how did I get here? 
And he's saying, don't see, he's saying, learn from this. I, I, was, I was king, but I was playing king. I was an imposter. I wasn't out at war when I should have been. I was a fake. I was the scornful. And it cost me everything. I killed Bathsheba's wife, my general, and then everything unravels from there. His daughter is taken advantage of. His son dies. His own son pushes him out of his kingdom. Why? Because David didn't have anybody to hold him accountable. We also see David make this mistake with one of his sons, right? When King Solomon is about to become king and his other son raised up, David's son raises up and starts a coup against Solomon. And the Bible says the whole reason he started that coup is because David left him alone, meaning he never disciplined him. Right? And then what ends up happening? Well, King Solomon becomes king and ends up killing him, right? What am I saying, friends? We have to have accountability. You remember Elijah when he comes down. We'll get to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. See, this is why it needs to be a series, y'all. So next time pastors go out of town, we'll continue this. It'll be like three months, so y'all earmark this, all right? You remember Elijah? He's up on Mount Carmel. They kill all those false prophets. And then he comes down and he runs away. And the Bible gives us very specific instructions of what happened. It says that he left his servant and his armor bearer and he found himself alone sitting under the sycamore tree. And what did he say? After this powerful experience he just had with God, he sits down because one woman says, if you're not dead by this time tomorrow, I'm coming to kill you. He just killed all the false prophets. God, the, the power of God fell, burned up the entire offering, sucked it. He saw the power of God, and now he's scared of one woman. And the reason he's afraid underneath that sycamore tree, and he says, God, take my life now, is because he's all alone. He's by himself. Lots of times we just need accountability, so when we get in that negative headspace, we've got somebody that says, come on, shake it off. Come on, you know this isn't right. Look at what God's done. Look at your life. Look, look, at, look at the family he's given you. Look at the wife he's given you. Look, look, look at how you had dinner last night. And we need somebody to remind us that God is with us. We need somebody to grab us by the shoulders and say, come on, friend, pick up your head. You can do this. We're marching on together for victory. Over in 1 Corinthians, it talks about the whole body. And we know this portion of scripture. It says the human body has many parts, but many parts make up only one body. So with the body of Christ. Some of us are Jews, some are Gentiles, some are slaves, and some are free. But we've all been baptized into Christ's body by one spirit. We've all received the same spirit. Yes, the body has many parts, not just one part. If the foot says, I'm not a part of the body because I'm not a hand, does that make it any less a part of the body? If the ear says, I'm not a part of the body... I'm only an ear and not an eye, would that make it any less part of the body? So what is he saying? We all know what he's saying here. He's saying, friends, it doesn't matter if you're an usher, a children's worker, a parking lot attendant, or the preacher, you're all part of the body. Doesn't matter who you are, you're all part of the body. And there's not one piece that is more vital than the other. Right? We're all in here, we're all doing it together. Verse 17, suppose the whole body were an eye, then how could you hear? Or if the whole body were just one big ear, then how could you smell anything? But God has made our bodies with many parts. I love this next part. He's put each part just where he wants it. What a strange thing the body would be if it only had one part. Yes, there are many parts, but only one body. But you can never say, now watch this, but you can never say to the hand, I don't need you. You can't say that. You, you, we need each other. God built us for fellowship. He built us understanding that we need one another. And there's so many reasons that we need one another. We're, we're supposed to spur and provoke one another unto good works. And you can't do that if you don't have fellowship with one another. We need to be held accountable. And lots of times when we say accountable, I know what we're thinking is we're probably thinking, well, you're asking somebody to watch over me. Am I my brother's keeper? Am I supposed to keep them from sin? No, that's not even just what I'm talking about. I'm talking about accountability. Like, where were you last week for worship? We missed you. Just, just you know, is everything okay with you and your family? Are you all right? Friends, that's accountability. 
And we need one another in order for that to happen. Over in Romans chapter 12, verses 3 through 5, it says, Because of this privilege and authority God has given me, I give each of you this warning. Don't think of yourselves better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves, measuring yourself by the faith God has given you. Just as our bodies have many parts, each part is a special function, so it's with Christ's bodies. We are many parts, but one body. We belong to each other. We're here for one another, and we're supposed to be developing and building these relationships. Proverbs chapter 27, 27, we know this. It says, iron sharpens iron. So does a man sharpen the countenance of his friend. Listen to me, friends. I brought this illustration, but we really don't have time for it this morning. But iron, just, just think if you would. Well, I'm just going to do it. I'm going to run down here. Yee. Hopefully I don't hurt myself because I'm hurrying. This is a knife and a sharpening stick. I took it from the kitchen, boo. <laughs> These two items, they need each other. And as I go through the process, got a doctor right down there just in case, you know. Get the dental floss. <laughs> He's going to need stitches. <laughs> Proverbs 27, 17, or 27 talks about iron sharpens iron. This process can't happen if these two are separated. If one's in its living room and one's at the grocery store when they're supposed to be at worship. The process happens when we come together. And, and you can't make me sharper if you're not here and I can't make you sharper if I'm not here. We have to work this process together. This is why, why do you think, it's, I'm going to put this blade down. Why do you think the devil works so hard to get you away from your church? Why do you think when you wake up in the morning, you don't feel like coming? Because he knows you coming is going to make you better and it's going to make the person next to you better. And so he's just real happy to keep you in bed. Well, you can watch online. And then if we were honest, now some of you may be truly diligent when you watch online Mm-hmm. We in the kitchen. I'm filling up my coffee cup. Y'all, I go on vacations. I watch online. Don't try to lie to me down there. You doing stuff. Some of y'all be doing stuff when you're sitting in the room, but we just move on. I digress. <laughs> Pastor Mark's back, y'all. He'll be here Sunday, all right? Proverbs chapter 17, 17 says, A friend loves at all times. A brother is born for a time of adversity. The body of Christ is born for a time of adversity. So when we're down bad, we have church family that can lift us up. And so we come here and we build these relationships. And then through these relationships, listen to me, this is so important. We don't have all the time that I was hoping to have this morning. But out of relationships, it births important conversations. And conversations are what we need to be having so we can be held accountable. You don't talk to people that you don't know. You know, we can just, and I'm so grateful that you're all here. But I think this morning as I've talked to however many people I talk to, uh-oh. I don't know if I want to pull on this thread, but we already started. I feel like sometimes, let me say it this way. Most of the time, casual conversations are not real conversations. How are you today? Oh, I'm great. How are you, brother? I'm great. And then that's it. And then also, I wonder sometimes if we're so well taught and we hear the message of faith all the time, if we struggle in our honesty. We feel like we can never tell somebody the truth about our situation. Friends, you can be vulnerable and be honest and still be in faith. And we need to have these moments of vulnerability because vulnerability, what it produces is dependency. When you're not vulnerable with God, you will not depend on God. He, he loves it when you come to him and you just confess. 
We don't try to cover up, but we expose. You know, if you're, if, you're, if you're having a tough week when you come to church on Sunday morning and someone says, how was your week? Don't just try to put perfume on it and polish all up. Tell them what's going on. Well, it was a, a difficult week. I would love for you to talk to me or agree with me. Out of these relationships come conversations. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11 says, For who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except for the Spirit of God. Now, we know before this, the Apostle Paul is telling us that God will reveal all things to us for the Spirit of God knows, yea, even the deep things of God. So the things of God are not hidden from you. But the point of this is your, your friends that you worship with in the body of Christ, the people sitting to your left and sitting to your, they have no idea what you're going through for no one knows the thoughts of the person except for the spirit of the person. And so for someone to know what you're going through, you must share it with them. And when you come, you build these relationships. And as you build relationships, listen to me, this is key. You find out who you can and cannot share with. Because I'm just going to be 100 with you, fam. I ain't showing you everything about my life unless I trust you. And there's some people, like Joseph, you're not supposed to tell. Because they will put you in a pit and then sell you out to the first person they can. So I don't tell everybody, but I do have relationships with people that I trust that if I'm going through it, I can call them or text them. And I know I'm going to, listen, we're not here to judge. We're here to help. I'd rather have good friends than many friends. So we want to build quality. And this is why it's so important who you build relationships with. Just as the Bible teaches us, it says that bad company corrupts good morals. So what's he saying? Don't just go build close relationships with everybody because I promise you what's on them will get off on you. You need to build relationships with the right people. And God is saying, so I've given you this system to help you build these right relationships. It's called church where we gather and we assemble and we serve together is connect groups and fellowship groups where we build relationships and through those relationships we find out who we can and who we can't trust. She. And then we exchange information so that way when you're going through it, you can reach out to me and when I'm going through it, I can reach out to you. And friends, I'm telling you, if this does not happen, you probably won't be worshiping God in a year's time. The devil will pull you away because you haven't had anybody to help you be accountable to this life of faith. So we build these relationships. James 5.16, watch this scripture. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for one another. Doesn't say confess your sins and then post it. doesn't say confess your sins and then tell everybody else. Confess and then let's pray. Ooh, I get that struggle. Friend, I've had that struggle. This is how, let's pray about it. And, and, and you know what? Let's go ahead and do this. It, you, I'm going to text you every Monday morning a scripture that's helped me. And together, we're going to overcome this. To just think that we don't have any struggles is so naive. Life hits all of us. <laughs> and maybe your struggles look different than mine, but we can help one another overcome. If we'll build these relationships and if we'll take time and say, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and confess, this is what I'm dealing with. I've been having pain in my body and I've been questioning, can God really heal me? I've been dealing with that. I need someone to hold me accountable to what the word of God says and stand in agreement with me. I'm going to go ahead and confess my struggle and let's come together and let's overcome. I've been really struggling with corporate worship. I'm not sure I get the idea of that. It no longer makes sense to me. Instead of just hiding that in your heart and letting the devil work overtime, why don't we have a conversation with somebody? What is all this about? What's going on in this place? So we can thought, work this process together. And yes, it can be ugly, it can be messy, but we're coming out the other side in victory. Amen. I've been thinking about this or I've been struggling with this. Let's go to lunch. 
Let's talk about it while they're playing basketball and we're sitting on the stage. Let's talk about it. So we can overcome. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. We have to have these conversations. I wonder lots of times, you know, when you go back to Genesis chapter 3 and it talks about, I've actually ministered to this, to our mighty men's at the men's conference. You know, it talks about how when Eve partook, it says Adam was right there with her. A homie's not out fishing or, you know, he's not down working for IBM. No, he's right there. He's right there. He's watching all of this unfold. And I wonder if the text would be a little bit different if Adam and Eve would have just paused and let's have a conversation. This is what the enemy is saying. This is what God has said. Let's have a conversation and let's figure out what's right and let's figure out what we're supposed to do in this situation. Let's figure out together how to move forward. I wonder, and I know it was prophetic, but I heard someone say this, I wonder if Judas would have talked to somebody. Would have he really betrayed Jesus for a bag of gold? Maybe a conversation, things could have changed. Judas, come on, man. You know I love you, bro, but this is, this is foolish. You can't do this. What if Peter, after Jesus told him, you're going to deny me, what if Peter would have went to the other apostles and said, listen, Jesus said, I need some help. I don't want to betray my Lord and Savior. I don't want to deny him. I wonder if there would have been a conversation if maybe some of these texts would have read a little bit different. If they would have went to one another and had conversations and allowed fellowship to provoke one another unto good works, to provoke one another unto the right decision so they could hold fast to the faith. Friends, we've got to develop these relationships so we can have important conversations so that the devil does not devour a single life. God's given you a great asset with the ministers he's placed over you and with the body he's placed next to you. He's given you great assets. Let's start using them.